My name is Wadas Rosias. Um, I have experience with data mesh mostly at my previous company, TPG Media. Um, but today I won't be talking about them. I'll, I'll give the floor to our three guest speakers of today and, and, and lead their discussion about the rise of data mesh. And our guests are Andy Mott from Starburst, Samia Rahman from CGen, and James Sarah from Microsoft. But I'll give them a bit of floor to introduce them more in depth. So Andy. Thank you, Juanes. Um, yeah, so Andy Mott, uh, I'm a solution architect at Starburst. Uh, in my day job uh, and in my uh, my hobby, my part time and my weekends uh, are spent um, with customers and organizations that are considering the move to uh, to a data mesh, whatever that may mean to them, um, and how Starburst kind of fits into that journey. Um, and uh, and also, I quite like to have the uh, the debates and the discussions on the uh, the data mesh uh, lending Slack community as well. Thank you, Andy. And a, a more in-depth uh, introduction from Samia. Hi, everyone. I'm Samia. I'm the director of data and AI focused on strategy and architecture at CGen, uh, where I joined six months ago. And we're on a mission to better the lives of cancer patients. Um, and my experiences prior to joining have been partnering with Jamak and other folks at ThoughtWorks to execute data mesh in healthcare and pharma spaces. Um, so I want to say I have become a practitioner uh, and I am learning from past experiences and uh, applying them again and again. Yeah. And then last but not least, we have James at the table. I could be least, that's fine. My name is James Sarah. I'm a data and AI solution architect at Microsoft. I've been here for about eight years with a brief stint at EY. I'm on the delivery side where I have a lot of conversations with customers who are interested in, in what, learning out what a data mesh is along with a data fabric and a data lake house and a modern data warehouse. All these confusing terms has, has become a very popular topic, not just with customers but within Microsoft to try to understand what all these different architectures mean and and so I'm always happy to be in conversations like this where we can try to educate people on what's the difference between all these architectures and when may a particular architect like Data Mesh be right for them for their, their individual situation. James, you're already talking about what's the difference between Data Mesh and other architectural design patterns. Uh, Andy was talking, uh, was saying, um, we hear data mesh at customers, whatever it means for them. So what does a data mesh mean for you? Uh, could you explain a bit? Yeah, I'll be the one to jump in the fire with, with data mesh. And when we talk about these other technologies, uh, over time we've had everything that was centralized. So you can look at a modern data warehouse, a data fabric, a data lake house. The idea is, to pull in all this data and centralize it with an IT have ownership of that and IT cleans the data and and that brings some challenges to it which data mesh tries to address and and if you look at the, the concept of data mesh the idea is that we decentralize things and so instead of copying all the data into a central location that IT controls we have all these domains and each of these domains or think of them groups within your company maybe you have HR and finance, and they, instead of having all the, them give the data to IT is they control the data, they maintain ownership, they clean the data, they make it available through that domain so everybody can use it. And you have dozens or if not hundreds of domains all doing that and having their own copy of the data for their particular subject matter and then the benefit of a data mesh, at least in theory, is that this helps with scaling, organizational scaling. So as I have more domains, each domain has their own mini IT team, and they're able to then scale out as for people when they get more and more domains, as well as technical scaling. So instead of having everything centralized and having a one platform that is trying to handle all the data, you have each of their organizations, each of those domains handling the data and that, at least again, in theory, it makes it easier to scale out instead of trying to scale up. And so that's where the use cases come in for data mesh where customers have these issues with ownership and quality of data and scaling 
that the data mesh tries to address. And so it's this decentralized approach. And it gets confusing because there's these four key principles of data mesh. And are you, in fact, building a data mesh if you don't follow all those four key principles? And then even though it's decentralized, there are certain things that are remain centralized. And this, this is where it gets, it gets even more confusing in that, and, and Microsoft approaches that, well, we don't want each of the domains having their own storage. Instead, we are going to have a central storage, but each domain will get a folder within that storage and have ownership of it. So it doesn't mean that everything has to be decentralized and they're off doing their own thing is certain things like storage can be centralized. And you may have groups that are centralized that provide governance from those domains because you can't have them all go and doing their own thing. So they have to follow some guidelines. Well, we have a centralized team that's gonna give them those guidelines. And, and what I'm finding is there are exceptions to maybe the data mesh in theory or the purity version of that. And, and this is where it gets confusing because each company is building what they may call data mesh, but it could be very different than what other companies are building. Thank you, James. Um, for those having joined the session, um, from now on, you hear quite a lot of information about data mesh. If this triggers any question, feel free to uh, to ask your question in the Q and A, and I will address it. Um, Andy, you were talking about customers and whatever they believe data mesh is. Yeah. Does does it is is it quite similar to what James was describing? Do you agree with his definition? I I I do. I think uh, I think where I would maybe build on a little is uh, the to kind of put some sort of boundaries around data mesh as opposed to something another architectural approach. I think organizations that are, are kind of uh, adopting this decentralization of data ownership, I think that is um, arguably, if you've got organizations that are doing that, I think that is more towards a data mesh architecture. Um, than organizations that are not. And so that to me is a uh, is kind of a, a definition point, if you will. So if an organization has, is, is moving in that direction for whatever reason, um, then that to me is, it, it kind of signals data mesh um, rather than, than anything else. Um, I think the, uh, I think there are lots of pieces that, that James touched on. Um, this idea of getting those people in those groups and those business units uh, to actually do the things that we want them to do in terms of building data and data products and making those then available. Uh, I think there's there's really interesting questions around how you incentivize uh, those people to do that. Um, and you know that obviously gets into the second pillar of data mesh, which is the uh, kind of data as a product. Um, and even with data as a product, I think there's some really interesting uh, sort of discussions and, and thought processes. So. Um, Many like many organizational units will will use their own data for their own thing. So, so if we pick finance, for example, um, there will be many data um, artifacts that are used within finance that arguably don't become data products. Uh, and arguably, a data product is something that's only kind of able to be consumed and and uh, used by other functions. And that gets back to this incentivization thing. So. You know, I may be really incentivized to build data artifacts to support my work, but am I really incentivized to build those data products that help others to do their work? Um, I think that's uh, that's really interesting as well. In it, and I'm sorry I'm going off on a slight tangent here, but but these are some of the thought processes that when I'm kind of in conversation and you know, consulting with organisations, these are some of the the. Uh, if you like, signals that, that this is more like a data mesh than an alternative uh, architectural approach. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I, I do believe so. And if I summarize with what the both of you were saying is, is it's about decentralizing ownership. It's about building a data product within your domain, either considering it first as an artifact and then scaling it towards a product. And that definitely becomes interesting if um, you don't only do it for your own purposes, but also for the company-wide purposes. So even though you're having decentralized ownership, you're breaking the silo. Um, yeah. Samia, is that something you agree with or, or would you want to add up something to? Um, 
I, I think a lot of the things you guys highlighted, uh, they, they are part and parcel of data mesh. But to me, it if I were to kind of simplify it, uh, which I don't see in the other architectures, they're very technical or how do you organize the data? There's that organizational aspect that uh, James had mentioned. So it's the social and technical architecture with the people process and tech. So even those units of data products, I think that applies at all layers, even if you are the customer, the sole customer, because the product can evolve, right? Initially, it's adding value to yourself. Then you're probably having other people who are interested in it. So your product is now evolving into uh, more, um, uh, or you have more adopters, so you want to mature it and build additional data products on it. Uh, so to me, th that uh, incentivization or the social aspect of it is emergent. It happens naturally as things evolve, as data is discovered, the value is seen in it, and then other people are also wanting for that uh, value in their context or in their business function. So finance data, for example, the financial reports, apart from your executive reporting, your financial data is important to your commercial sales. And they would want that to maybe target and improve their uh, sales performance, right? So to me, um, the, the four principles of data mesh really bring in that framework or the mindset by which you can incrementally get to that value is what I would say. Thanks for this, this great extra information, Samia. Um, I, I think we're noticing that it's still hard to actually point a finger to what the definition is it's it's quite broad and it's not only an architectural point uh it, it also has an organizational impact um so let's maybe go a bit to the why of data mesh what are the problems you see data mesh is trying to address samuel so it's <clears throat> complexity it's that domain complexity um, I see healthcare and pharma really, or biotech space, life sciences space, really benefiting from it. Even prior to data mesh coming out, 2016, data or scientists in the community talked about the fair principles. Uh, because data sets didn't have the, uh, just the core basic idea of like, it needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, they were struggling to get the value or even exchange the data across communities within companies. So to me, in those complex uh, scientific spaces, data mesh uh, can be really beneficial. Um, and also very matrixed organizations, uh, because you are going to have different kinds of data ownerships and the value will um, incrementally or um, build at, uh, over your business's value chain. So to me, in those kind of organizations, that social architecture associated with the technical architecture becomes very, very important. If you don't design with that from a foundational perspective, you end up with very centralized IT heavy platforms where uh, the business is frustrated because now you're waiting in queue for data to be ingested. You're waiting in queue for the reports to be built and those report developers or even the data engineers, they don't understand the domain. They are not bioinformaticians. They're not uh, a cancer researcher, right? Uh, so it's uh, to me, data mesh, uh, is trying to address that other problem of how do you actually bring that collaborative and collective, um, uh, I've been listening to Linda Hall, she talks about the collective genius. Um, it's bringing those domain experts and the, the tech experts together to get to that business outcome or the business value. So to me, whenever I see domain complexity, that's when I'm always considering does data mesh make sense here if the complexity is simple um, or the complexity is low such as um, I own a coffee shop I'm not going to go build data mesh I'm okay with simple database with simple insights I'm good to go right even if I scale my business across the globe as a franchise I'm going to keep it as a simple centralized modern data platform. My domain is not complex. It's quite simple for the everyday employee, all employees to understand the business value uh, that can emerge from that data. Um, so to me, data mesh is unique or trying to address that complexity of the domain. 
Perfect. Thanks, Samia. Uh, I, I definitely remember you stating if you bring the domain expert together with the technology expert, then uh, you can move towards the business value. I think that's that's really a nice point data is trying to address. Um, for our participants, I'm keeping an eye on the q and I'll pop in a bit later uh, with the questions that are being asked there. First, up to James, are, are there other um, issues you see data measures trying to address? Yeah, I think she was spot on with the reasons that companies are looking at data mesh. I always say, look, data mesh is one data architecture among the many that you could choose from. And it could be a great solution for your business or other ones could be better. The reality is it, data mesh is gonna to be too much for a huge majority of the co companies on there. So you have to look at, oh, okay, is our company having problems where the data mesh would be the best solution for those problems? And as she touched on, it could be that you have problems with ownership and cleaning the data and scaling and, and, and a data mesh may be the best solution for those. But you have to be, you have to be a company that's very open to change. And I think that's the biggest problem I see with customers is if you have all these domains who are used to just copying the data to a central location and IT doing stuff with it. If you go to those domains now and say, okay, we're gonna change things up. You have to now create the data warehouse and data lake and make it available to everybody else. You've got to follow some contract and make API calls available so people can find out what data you have and be able to grab the data. And you can clean it now and you can own it. And okay, that all sounds great, but the pushback would be, look, I can barely keep things running. So I don't want to do all that. And you take the data, do whatever you want with it, but I'm not, you're asking me, I got to create my own IT team and have my own budget and do all this stuff. So the problem then is how do you convince them that this is the best approach? How do, how do they buy into the, the data mesh? And it's not enough to say, hey, you're doing it for the greater good. You have to give them incentive. And that's where I see the biggest challenge is. And, and some companies are doing it. They have this executive support and they educate everybody and they realize, oh, this is actually the best approach for us to take and let's do it this way because the data mesh will take you a lot longer to build than any of these other architectures on there. So to me, it's, it's a, it could be a very good solution but only for a small percentage. And what I try to do at Microsoft is clear up, we have just a lot of talks about data mesh and people not understanding what it is. And then when you explain it to them, they go, okay, interesting, but that doesn't fit for our organization, there's just a lot of hype to it. And even Zamek has in her book, uh, the eight categories that you have to score medium or high on to be able to, to, to look at data mesh, things like organizational complexity, long-term commitment, executive support, early adopters, tech at core. A lot of this, most companies are not scoring high on there. So this wouldn't be an option for them. And what I think I'll see, I'm starting to see more of is people take some great principles of the data mesh and it's, and using them and it's make it's the, the best thing about data mesh is it gets people to think through how can we get better value out of their data? Where do they implement a data mesh fully or partially? They're at least having these conversations as opposed to let's just give all the data and dump it and we'll figure it out along the way. And so that's where I see the greatest value is companies are stepping back and saying, what can we do with this data that's gonna give us better business decisions? How can we get more insights to it? And so this is the one thing I do like about the data mesh is it's opening up these conversations with customers and, and how it's technically solved is always going to be a challenge. And a data mesh is not gonna make it easier. There's no data mesh in the box. And so where companies are struggling now is how do we use the technology to best solve this? And a lot of technology is just not there yet to do some of the things that data mesh has in its principles there, but hopefully we'll get there and we'll have in the end, customers using some variation of a data mesh and call it data mesh. I don't care, but in the end, if you're getting more value out of the data, that's that's the main point. Thanks. And yeah, I hear James saying it uh, It shook some customers awake. Uh, it made us think about data. Also here, yeah. it's, it's addressing ownership. Um, it's removing a bottleneck, addressing ownership, probably to, to increase quality of data products. Um, is this something you see as well with customers? 
Yeah, yeah. so um, James and uh, Sammy have covered a, a lot, and there's a lot of jumping off points that I feel, a lot of rabbit holes that I want to kind of go down <laughs> and continue, because um, they covered a lot of good stuff. Um, I guess if I was to almost sort of summarize uh, kind of some of the things that they said, and uh, and I know that's your job, Wannis, but but um, I sort of see this spectrum, I guess, of um, data mesh at one end and like a single, all the data in a single operational analytical system with maybe one person doing all the work that's related to data and being you know, fully centralized. And every organization is probably, well, every organization is on this spectrum. And you know, arguably, some are further to the fully centralized, um, some are fully, uh, some are further to the kind of let's say de fully decentralized. And I don't think anyone's really at any end, maybe except for that coffee shop that Samir uh, mentioned. Um, but and I think what I see is organizations sort of see it through the the lens of data mesh, kind of moving towards more decentralization. Is that a decent? Is that a data mesh? You know, um, we, we can have that discussion, but I, I certainly think that, that that's kind of what the way I see things at the moment is we have the spectrum when you have organizations that are moving that way. And, and when we think about why they're moving that way, um, on, on top of the things that have already been said, I think there's uh, two, uh, in my opinion, very kind of concrete examples of, of why organizations might want to move that way. There are other solutions to these problems, but, but the first one is you know, uh, and I think Samir said it in a, a, a sort of more eloquent way than I, but um, you've got someone in a, you know, in a, a business unit who wants some data and they, they basically phone someone up. Uh, that generates a ticket which gets put in a queue and at some point in the future, new data artifacts are made available and they may no longer be relevant because the question has changed, you know. Um, and I'm sure we have all worked with and for organizations where, you know, that, that's been a thing. Um, and that, that ability to be more responsive, I think, is, is actually one of the reasons why organizations are interested in data mesh. On the other side, I think there's another good reason why data mesh is interesting. Uh, again, you may be able to solve this with different architectures, um, but one that I think is less talked about, and that's kind of the more proactive side. So we may have applications that are sitting above uh, operational data stores. You know, so you know, what's the current balance? How much data have I used on my uh, my, my phone contract or whatever at this point in time? But there's applications that are kind of sat there and they're constantly updating current state of the business. Um, and it may be that with those applications, we can capture more and different information. Um, you know, so uh, maybe a really simple example is we've got a website and we're collecting website traffic. It may be that that application, you know, an off the shelf application that we've purchased may allow us to switch a switch and we can collect and track mouse movements, just as an example. As, a, as the operational person, there's no real incentivization for me to do that. And I'm kind of quite far from the person who may make a decision based on that to, you know, alter the website. So I may never flick that switch. We may never capture that information. And so the analyst on the other side may never know that that's even available. And so I kind of think data mesh uh, has the the, uh, the ability to resolve that uh, you know that reactive issue where we you know pick up the phone and we want something we want it tomorrow, um, but it also has that ability to resolve some of those more proactive things that we could be doing, but we're not really sure if we should do them because we don't really know if anyone cares or if there's any value to the business. And I, I think um, as you move further to the right on that spectrum, or the right in my case, um, towards decentralization, I think you start to solve some of those issues. Uh, I do think you could probably solve them in different ways, but, uh, but Data Mesh certainly has the, um, the ability or, or some of the capabilities or provide some of the capabilities, I should say, to start to solve some of those problems. Thanks. Samia, uh, both you and Andy are talking about um, advantages of bringing people closer together, domain experts and tech experts, or in the case of, uh, of Andy, bringing everyone together, having the, the technical skills and the, the problems that they might be addressing. Um, in the q and I, I see someone asking, aren't you aiming for a for a dream state of processes. Um, whereas Andy is saying, well, it's kind of a spectrum where you can land um, your own data mesh approach. Um, where do you see it landing? How far would you go now being a practitioner 
and um, does it apply for everyone except for the the local grocery store? <laughs> um, I, I think it, it always depends. To me, what I often see is people forget the business objectives and they get end up using the hype cycle. I think uh, James also mentioned it. Um, to me, at the end of the day, whether you use a data fabric, a data warehouse, those to me are uh, just the physical, tangible thing where your data is stored. Data doesn't necessarily need to be copied. I can have a centralized data platform, centralized data governance tooling, but it's that operating model and getting the business outcome associated with what value are you getting out of the data is uh, where I think organizations miss the mark. Um, I've, I've gone into uh, companies where they've built a nice big data platform. Data has been sitting there for a while, but only four or five use cases have been activated. This is the last decade, over the last decade. It took them a long time with the Hadoops and all the on-prem <laughs> infrastructure. With now with the cloud shift, I still have great infrastructure to me, the missing layer, like if we kind of learn from the mistakes of the past, it's that bis business outcome orientation. And regardless of if I do data mesh or I solve it for a simple coffee store, I need to think about what is the business question I'm trying, trying to answer? What is the scientific problem I'm trying to solve that will advance my business, right? Or advance um, how I develop a drug, whatever the problem statement is. I think that that is the, we all need to agree that is the shared objective, regardless of which approach you take to get to that objective. Um, so to your original question, which spectrum, it always depends. If you don't try to think of the context and the environment and your organizational maturity, et cetera, you are going to force things which will never, or you will end up with a lot of failure problems. Thanks a lot. Um, and the, you are already introducing a bit of spectrum. So I assume um, you are stating there's a bit of data mesh for everyone, depending again of your context, how far you would go. Um, so I'll, I'll dive a bit deeper with the Q&A question. Um, someone is seeing the advantage, but is uh, the team currently responsible for the data infrastructure? How can you convince them to change? How can you convince the, the data platform owner to, to move towards the direction of a data mesh? So I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the first thing that we need to just think about is separating data from technology uh, in terms of responsibility. Um, and actually that's quite a hard thing for people to let go of because historically the people who have kind of owned data have also owned the technical infrastructure. Um, you know, if we think back to Oracle DBAs, uh, that's a, a sort of a very historic, but uh, I think a good example. Um, so that's the first thing, and that's actually quite hard. Um, with some of the cloud platforms, uh, I think that becomes kind of less hard. Um, and maybe James has got a view on this because you know, he's more more uh, knowledgeable on the, the cloud front, I think. But um, I think it becomes less hard because um, a lot of the cloud technologies sort of abstract away, you know, the, the, the deep technical knowledge that people think is their value. Um, and actually, they don't necessarily need to have as much deep technical knowledge because the you know, like cloud uh, sort of abstracts that away or many cloud services. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Uh, and I, I don't really have a good uh, approach, I'm afraid, to sort of, I don't have a magic bullet. But in terms of the kind of the next step, once you've made that switch and you've kind of uh, sort of separated out technology uh, or infrastructure, let's call it, and, uh, and data, um, what I've seen Quite, work quite well. And again, this is organizations that are moving towards and they're on a journey. Um, and this sounds heresy with respect to data mesh is kind of like a hub and spoke approach where actually that um, the, the folks that are responsible for data stay kind of relatively centralized. Uh, and then they get aligned to maybe a particular business unit. And maybe you have uh, you know, an approach where they still are part of a central team, but they you know, they just sort of have a dotted line into a business function, um, or maybe you have some sort of common approach, 
uh, you know, where they, they go into each team for a period of time. And actually, I think that's that's a relatively easier sell to a data person, because what you're essentially saying is we would like you to really become an expert in a in a, a domain, um, you know, like finance or maybe some sort of you know, clinical trials or, uh, you know, or, or customer churn or something where we want you to become an expert in that with respect to data. Um, and you know the, I, the pushback you make there is oh, I want to do a bit of everything, and, and then you get into this model of maybe secondments or you know movement matrix models or movement over time or whatever. But but um, that hub and spoke starts with a, a relatively large hub and relatively thin spokes, and then over time the hub has the potential to get smaller, um, with the spokes essentially getting bigger. And and what I mean by that is those data people start to actually become more and more aligned and maybe even embedded in the domain teams and that's kind of the if you like the, the first step or, or maybe not the first step but maybe the first one or two years in terms of changing people's roles and responsibilities um because every time you you know technology is easy right you know uh, it's relatively easy compared to people people are hard because people have kind of you know feelings and uh, they want to do the things they want to do and so you things just take longer when you're changing organizational structures um, but that kind of approach that starting with that hub and spoke and sort of selling it to the data engineers so they become more uh, more valuable if you will because they have that domain specialization or that domain focus i, I think that's some, certainly something that i've uh, i've seen uh, i definitely agree before passing the words to james i also see samia is loving to to dive a bit deeper on your answer yeah, to me, to make that change, I, I firmly believe in numbers because it's all about data. If you were to kind of map your data value chain, the time it takes from uh, the time it takes from ingesting your data to getting to that value all the way by the data analyst uh, who's going to use the data. So if you look at I need to ingest, I need to publish the data, I need to get access to it. When you do a value stream exercise, you will find out where are your bottlenecks. I think that is such a powerful exercise for an organization. It, don't jump into organizational change yet. Just look at that as a starting point and assess where you are at today. If it takes you nine months to get to a report or four months to get access to data, that's a smell, That's something's going on. And then that will organically, I think people are, if, if, if you, if the company is business oriented, then everyone will think about how do I fix this? And they will naturally gravitate towards making things self-service. To me, that exercise, we do it in DevOps as well, right? We did it in microservices in the software world. We map out the value stream and why did self-service platforms come about? Um, it's from that value proposition of, I have so many applications I wanna get out into production and that therefore I need that repeatable pattern. The same thing is for report developers, same thing for doing machine learning. Uh, so to me, that trick has really shown a lot of value in my career in the last decade. Thanks. James, uh, Samia and Andy are both focusing a bit on the organizational change and maybe pushing it a bit later in the in the chain of, of getting towards the data mesh. You were even one step uh, earlier, you were stating data mesh does not necessarily always be the correct uh, solution, can be also a data lake, a data warehouse, a lake house, whatever. Um, so, so where do you see data meshes fitting in? Which kind of companies should can be helped with data mesh? Yeah, I like what Andy was saying that you may see more of a hub and spoke solution, and I think it's going to be evolution. It comes down to ask customers, what's your pain point right now? And if they tell me their pain points, it may be that, oh, actually a data mesh may solve this, or it may be, well, we just need to fix a few things, what you're doing right, right now on that. And, and so if, if a customer comes to me and they have, I do a bunch of discovery, ask a lot of questions, and they're centralizing all this data, it's not as if you can go, okay, we're gonna create a data mesh and and come back in a few years and, and we'll flip a switch and everybody, you'll have this giant data mesh. It's gonna be an evolution. And you may start seeing certain domains pull out from the centralized and start creating their own internal uh, spoke of, of a data mesh in there. And 
they will create their own data lakes and data warehouses within their domain, but they will make that available to everybody outside of that. And along the way, you may get domains that say, look, I'm, I'm not going to build a data mesh because all it takes is one to say that and then you have a problem. So those ones can continue to be centralized while you have all these other spokes that are building out their domains and becoming a, a data mesh in there. And the challenge also with the data mesh is each domain is thinking of solving their own problems, but who is looking out for the bigger picture when I need to combine data from all these different domains? Who's the one that is going to say, we can get value if we combine this data, this data, this data from all the different domains. And, and so you don't want to lose track of, of somebody's got to be the central person that understands all the data and how to combine it to get more value out of it. And so you're not having all these individual spokes or domains doing their own thing. And, and that's where I see some customers struggling with the data mesh concept is, is don't lose sight of the fact that all this data can be combined to get value from it. And so, and, and these are my vision. This is not Microsoft, so I don't really represent them. I gotta make that clear. And I think the challenge too is without some of the technology being there yet, for example, in the data mesh of the principle, number three, where you're gonna have the ability to create domains sort of with a click of a button. The idea is we don't want each domain going and building their own thing, but rather we have a system in place that can easily fire up and create new domains. And then principle four is we have the ability to govern all those. And there's really no product yet for three and not much of, of solutions for four. So you can build a data mesh with a couple of principles, but is that really a data mesh? Well, maybe it is. But the idea is to get to all those four principles, but the technology is not there yet. So what I find is each customer is coming up with their own solutions and, and ways of doing it. And then they kind of convince each of the domains to do it the same way. You can't have one domain going and saying, we're going to build everything in Azure, another one going Google and Oracle. And Oracle, and it, it, it's, it's never going to work if everybody's doing their own thing. So there's got to be some standardization. Maybe you all standardize on the same cloud and the same set of technologies on there. So it's not giving you total flexibility, but enough that you can do things on your own, but also be part of this hub and spoke and not make it so impossible for people to govern it or, or manage it. Thanks. Um, can I come in on there? Um, on yeah. that, because I think that that's a, there's, there's a lot of interesting points. I, I would I would agree wholeheartedly with four, uh, with the James's view on four. I think yeah, um, what I've seen at the moment is essentially organizations doing unit tests, right, for, for data. Um, and that's how they're, um, that, that's kind of their mechanism for doing governance. It doesn't seem like a good approach, but, but that's really what they're doing. Uh, you know, they're putting in, does this field exist and does the field conform to this value uh, or this, this, this structure or whatever? And everyone has to conform to those, uh, you know, those kind of unit tests before they can make those products available. Um, with three, three is more interesting. Um, so I, and three is the, the concept of the self-service platform. Um, so I've seen a number of organizations that where they've essentially gone off and got different, gone with different clouds for different domains. Um, and at the moment they're, they're, they're sort of reasonably successful. Um, they may have to consolidate at some point uh, or not. But what I see is an interesting relationship appearing between the domains and the platform teams where the domains, uh, and I've seen this from one of the, the organizations that I work with quite a lot, the domains have, um, in their case, they were using a lot of uh, object store data. And there was a particular use case where they needed a, a basically a transactional database. Um, and they, I think they went down the use of uh, Postgres on, on one of the clouds. Um, but they, what they, what they basically did was they requested a technical capability of the platform team, of the central platform team. And then the central platform team went off and decided that Postgres was the most appropriate cost, scalability, whatever it was, work for whatever reason. Uh, and then they kind of made that available as an endpoint for that domain to then use to store data and, and make it available as a, as a product. Um, I'm not sure that's the right approach. I'm not sure it's the wrong approach, but it's an approach that, uh, that I'm seeing where the domains make a requirement for a technical capability. And then there is a central team 
that's responsible for deciding which platforms perhaps are, are you know used in that particular organization and then say they went off and, and decided on postgres but other organizations there's a a, a global um, pharmaceutical company that i've been working with they literally have um uh, they probably have about 30 or so domains today uh they, they interestingly went down the route of uh, organizing their domains first and then they consider essentially a data platform or what i would call a data platform to, to basically be a data product or, or where they put their data product so they have you know like snowflake and they have redshift um uh, there's one i think one function here has synapse um you know so they've basically gone down this multi-cloud approach uh where they are in their maturity is they haven't quite figured out how they're going to do the mesh, in my opinion, or the mesh part, which is basically linking the products together uh, and getting value from them. At the moment, they've got lots of domains that are generating lots of interesting and cool data products that all conform to the relevant standards. It's not, I would argue it's not really a mesh because they haven't got the interoperability yet, but that's kind of where their, you know, where their next step is. Um, and that's, so I think that's, there's just a lot of interesting uh, aspects, I think, to the technology piece. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to add that comment onto what James was saying. Thanks for uh, for popping in on the end. And by the way, you and James also answered a bit questions in the in the Q and A, um, where they are asking: Is lift and shifting all your data to Snowflake or, or Synapse or whichever technology is that a data mesh? No, it's making sure that you can connect the data as well and bring cross domain value. Um, must it be one technology? Maybe not, like the example you're giving. Um, can I, uh, sorry, can I jump in on that one as well? <laughs> sorry, I've got a, I've got a view on this. And again, I'd appreciate uh, Samir and James uh, view, but actually I think if, we, if we're really adopting a data mesh, I think some of the non-functional requirements that people have kind of historically uh, left, uh, you know, and, and focus on functional requirements, um, the non-functional requirements I think are maybe become more important or become more important than they were historically. Um, and what I mean by that is, it's not just that you know the data has to be secure or the platform needs to provide security or whatever it is, but actually I think interoperability of those platform components needs to be really important. So, um, so for example, if you have you may you may have multiple engines, uh, you know you may have uh, let's say Spark and a SQL engine that you want to point at the same data, um, and ideally you want the same security across those two engines, Spark and, and SQL. Um, and then ideally you want the same metadata um, because all the same metadata repository being interoperably used by those different engines. And, you know, there may be a streaming engine and an API engine and, and others as well. Um, you want them all to use the same metadata, in my opinion, this is, and all to be able to use the same uh, security kind of context. So it doesn't matter whether I come in this engine or this engine, I have the same user access, user rights um, through whatever data product. Uh, and I, I think without having that seamless interoperability, Actually, I think data mesh becomes really a hard problem because I I don't understand or I don't think there's anyone who really would have that responsibility in the data mesh kind of organizational structure. Because if I think about metadata and I think about security, they're really a data thing. They're a data concern, right? I shouldn't have a, someone in a, an IT function know that, you know, Jane in finance should be able to access this sort of data. That, that's not, you know, that, that, that firmly needs to live in the domain. Um, the question then is who is responsible for doing like metadata or security synchronization yeah. if I have multiple systems? Uh, so it can't, it's not going to be the technology platform. And if we're then saying, oh, actually it should be in the domain, then we're requiring a lot of technology capabilities to sit in the domain. And then we get into actually mm. we've got an explosion of kind of talent requirements across domains. Um, so I think there's small things or seemingly small things like interoperability of uh you know uh, technologies which if we don't kind of think about and get right they have quite significant repercussions kind of later on um so i just wanted to throw that out yeah there well. i'd love to jump in here i i Sorry. find yeah. some of that a little hard to um accept in the sense that <laughs> the whole notion of a self-service data platform is mm -hmm. to provide the technical interoperability i as someone who is building the domain data product and have the domain knowledge and i'm getting to the business value i should not be burdened with how yep. do i get snowflake and databricks to interoperate i should not have yep. to think about the 
uh, format in the data which I publish in, or maybe the standards, the must have standards of metadata that I should be publishing. To me, that's where your fourth pillar, the federated governance, you're baking in those policies and standards into your catalog layer into your DevOps cycle for a data product. So you want to, as a platform team and the governance team, you have to design for those policies to be uh, giving feedback to those domain data owners. And I think that is something that's missed upon because people don't think about how do I give that feedback mechanism? As soon as I register my data on the platform, I should be told that, hey, you haven't provided the metadata. So your score, mm -hmm. you need to score your data, uh, that it's not usable yet, but you can incrementally evolve that as a domain person because other people, now it's registered in your catalog, people can explore it and there is interest. And when they, when the explorer and the data owner, or that could be a steward of that domain, et cetera, when they combine, they can incrementally add that metadata. It doesn't have to be perfect from day one, but to me, it's the responsibility of the platform and the governance team to make sure those are set and engineered properly. If you're not doing that, you're you're failing your domain, uh, mm -hmm. domain folks, because you're not simplifying their life. I don't think organizations should have IT budgets for each department, it should be yeah. provided by the centralized platform team that's providing that. Um, it's, it's it shouldn't really, be duplication of cost across the organization. But I'll, it's, I'll it's really nice where the, the discussion is heading, yeah. and I think it points out that a lot is still quite unclear or, or not agreed upon. Um, although, if I look to my personal opinion, I, I definitely agree with Samia. Um, but looking to time, unfortunately, our time is gone. Um, so if anyone still has questions, I'm quite certain um, you can address them to, to our three speakers. And then it rests me to thank you all for the discussion uh, having had today. So thanks, James, Samia, and Andy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.